Before we begin today's story, I wanted to let you know that this episode includes a special guest appearance by Cody Wheat from the Shots of History podcast. If you're into history and you enjoy alcohol, Cody's podcast is a great resource to learn about the history of alcohol in shot size pieces. Internationally renowned fashion designer Giorgio Armani started the company named after himself in 1975. In no time at all, wearing Armani was more than just wearing a nice suit. It was a status symbol. Hollywood took notice and, in 1980, Armani got his first credit in the costume and wardrobe department for a suit worn by Richard Gere in American Gigolo. Seven years later, Giorgio Armani was credited in the wardrobe department for the film set during Prohibition, The Untouchables. Except there's one little fact about Armani's work on The Untouchables that a lot of people may not know. Armani didn't work on The Untouchables. The following year, the woman who was the costume designer for The Untouchables, Marilyn Vance, received her only Oscar nomination for her work on the film. Shortly after the movie was released, Marilyn explained Armani's role was next to nothing. In fact, according to Marilyn, she was the only person who worked on the film that even met Giorgio Armani. Apparently, while she was working on the film, Marilyn traveled to Milan, Italy to meet with the now legendary fashion designer and get his input on the type of suits that would work for the movie. Armani not only offered some advice, but shipped over some suits for the actors to wear in the film. In exchange, Armani got a credit less than two minutes into the movie, and right after Marilyn, the woman who actually did the costume design work on the film. So we've just gone through tax season here in the US, which I know is everyone's favorite time of the year. The 16th Amendment is actually what gives the federal government the right to collect income tax, and while It's logical that maybe more progressively minded folks would support this. Establishing an income tax also had some support from unlikely places, namely the temperance movement and the people who were responsible for bringing about prohibition. Prior to 1913, the alcohol industry was the fifth largest in the US and the revenue collected from the sale of alcohol contributed as much as 40% of the tax revenue collected by the government. So the temperance movement knew that if they were going to get a national prohibition, they needed to have a way of supplementing that income that the government was receiving from the sale of alcohol. What the temperance movement didn't think through was just how difficult it would be to enforce prohibition and the underground market for alcohol that they were creating and how many cops were ultimately going to turn a blind eye to what was happening across the country. Not every cop was paid off, though, and The Untouchables is the story of a few cops trying to enforce the law, however controversial it might have been. I'm Cody Wheat. And I'm Dan Lefebvre. And this is Based on a True Story. If you're new to the show, this is where we take a moment before we jump into the history behind the movie to play two truths and a lie. Here's how it works. I'll share three things. Two of them are true, and one of them is a lie. Listen closely for the two truths scattered throughout the episode. Then, by process of elimination, you'll know which one is a lie. We'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. Okay, here they are. Number one, the real Al Capone never sold illegal alcohol during Prohibition. Number two, aside from Kevin Costner's character, all of the untouchables in the movie are fictional characters. Number three, ultimately, the real untouchables weren't the ones primarily responsible for putting away Al Capone. As you're enjoying today's story, if you hear something and wonder how it's spelled, or even if you just want to grab a written copy of this episode, you can get that at the show's home on the web, based on true story podcast.com. They're on a pay what you want model, which means you can pay a dollar, two dollars, a million dollars, or you can just grab it for free if you can't afford it, but you still want that written version. Once again, that's based on a true story podcast.com. And with that, let's compare history with Hollywood's version of The Untouchables. 
The movie begins with some text on screen setting up the situation. The year is 1930 and, according to the film, prohibition has caused war in the streets of Chicago. On one side you have law enforcement, and on the other you have organized crime led by the infamous Al Capone, who's being played by Robert De Niro in the movie. Specific scenery, of course, is made up, but this whole setup is true. In October of 1919, after years of petitioning and lobbying by anti-liquor groups across the nation, the U.S. Congress adds the 18th Amendment to the Constitution and officially makes the manufacture and sale of alcohol beverages illegal. As you can probably guess, it was a law that was not loved by everyone. While legal production of alcohol was prohibited, that only served to create this black market for production and sale of liquor. With a lot of money to be made free of taxes and government oversight, it was the perfect scenario for a crime boss by the name of Johnny Torrio to add bootlegging illegal liquor alongside his already profitable prostitution and gambling rings. The perfect opportunity actually presents itself in 1920 when, after hearing about the death of his friend's father, Johnny invited a young Al Capone to come to Chicago and help him run his new bootlegging operation. Now, about five years down the line, Johnny Torrio has a very close call with some rival gangs who actually almost killed him. And not wanting to tempt fate, Johnny decided to move back to Italy and handed over his entire operation in Chicago to Al Capone. Back in the movie, after the introduction to Robert De Niro's version of Al Capone, we meet the man on the other side. It's Kevin Costner's character, a man by the name of Elliot Ness. According to the movie, Elliot works for the Treasury Department, and he's been tasked with enforcing prohibition and taking down Al Capone's illegal liquor sales. Again, the basic plot is true. Unlike Al Capone, who was born in Brooklyn, New York, Elliot Ness was a native Chicagoan. He joined the Treasury Department at the age of 23 on August 26, 1926, shortly after Prohibition started. At the time, the Treasury Department had six different law enforcement agencies underneath it. One of these was the newly formed Prohibition Unit, which was tasked with hunting down and finding bootleggers. As a quick side note here, this agency under the Treasury Department would go on to become what we now know as the ATF, or the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. In the movie, the first raid we see Elliot Ness lead the team of law enforcement officers on turns out to be a bust. Instead of rum, Kevin Costner's version of Elliot Ness pulls out a pretty green umbrella from wooden crates. All of this is fictionalized for the film, but it's actually based on the fact that the real Elliot Ness didn't form the Untouchables right away. If you recall, Elliot joined the Treasury Department in August of 1926. It wasn't until three years later that the special team that we now know as the Untouchables was formed in August of 1929. In those three years, Elliot did indeed try to pull off some raids with varying degrees of success. Although Al Capone's group was probably the largest outfit in Chicago at the time, Prohibition agents raided bootleggers both large and small. To give you an idea of what some of the raids were like, there was one in April of 1927 when Elliot Ness and another Treasury Department agent named Frank Wilson went undercover to a horse racing track. Their cover led to information that 14 other agents used to raid nearby storehouses, seizing a wide range of whiskey, gin, rum, and beer. Oh, and to complete their cover, both Elliot and Frank dressed up like stallion-owning colonels from Kentucky. There's a mental image for you. Or there was another time when Prohibition agents led by Elliot captured a truck with a fictitious name on the side. Checking the contents of the truck, they found it filled with kegs of beer. That name on the side of the truck? Acme Scamless Tube Company. I kid you not. So, Elliot did lead many types of raids. Instead of sticking to historical accuracy for the first raid that we see in the movie, though, it uses one raid as a plot point to help build the idea that perhaps Al Capone was tipped off of the raid, and Elliot couldn't be successful working with the larger and often corrupt police force. It's easy to see why most Prohibition agents would take a bribe. 
when Prohibition went into effect, the federal government provided enough funding for only 1,500 agents, and those 1,500 men were supposed to cover the entire country. They were given guns and some vehicles, but most of them had little and oftentimes no training. Their job very quickly became one of the most dangerous jobs in the country, and they were paid about as much as a school teacher currently makes in the U.S., So when someone like Capone comes to you, offering you a level of money you probably thought you would never see in your entire life, and also eliminates the need for you to put yourself in harm's way, it'd be hard not to at least consider that deal. Okay, back to the movie. It's after this raid in the film when we see Kevin Costner's version of Elliot Ness come across an Irish-American beat cop named Jimmy Malone. Jimmy's played by Sean Connery in the movie. In fact, it was for his role as Jimmy Malone that earned Sean Connery his one and only Oscar win. After Jimmy, the other untouchables in the movie are Andy Garcia's character, Agent George Stone, and Charles Martin Smith's portrayal of Agent Oscar Wallace. All of these, including Jimmy Malone, are fictional characters. In truth, there were 10 men, including Elliot Ness, who were in The Untouchables. Of course, in a movie, it's tough to have an ensemble cast of 10 characters, so perhaps that's why the filmmakers slimmed down the number to four. While there's no one-to-one match for the men that we see in the movie and their real counterparts, as is often the case, the characters on screen take bits and pieces of truth from the real people. For example, Sean Connery's character of Jimmy Malone was an Irish-American who served as Kevin Costner's unofficial second-in-command on the small task force. In reality, the man who served as the unofficial second-in-command to Elliot Ness was another Irish-American named Martin Lahart, or Marty as he was called. Although, in the film, Jimmy Malone was also a beat cop of nearly four decades before, using his experience to help guide Kevin Costner's version of Elliot Ness. To contrast that, the real Marty Lahart was 30 years old when he joined Elliot's team in 1929, so he couldn't have had four decades of experience. In addition to Marty and Elliot, the other members of the real Untouchables were Lyle Chapman, Barney Cloonan, Thomas Friel, Bill Gardner, Mike King, Joseph Leeson, Paul Robsky, and Samuel Seeger. Oh, and as a quick side note, that's the initial 10 members of Elliot's team. Others, such as Jim Seeley and Al Wolf, would also help the team out later on. Despite having an abundance of people to base their characters on, one of the untouchables we see in the film wasn't based on any of these real people. The relatively meek character of the accountant, Oscar Wallace, was very loosely based on a man we learned about earlier, Frank Wilson. Although Frank had performed raids with Elliot and actually worked closely with him, he wasn't a part of the untouchables team. His primary focus and his primary work was with a different government agency, the IRS, and he was trying to pin tax evasion on Al Capone. As a fun little fact, later in his career, Frank Wilson actually goes on to become the chief of the Secret Service and is eventually a part of the team investigating the kidnapping of Charles Lindbergh Jr. Back in the movie, after forming a team of people he can trust, Elliot leads his Untouchables team to an immediate success when they raid a warehouse of Al Capone's liquor in a local post office. While this specific event was made up for the movie, the truth is that Elliot Ness and the Untouchables team did have a number of successful raids that brought his team's work to the attention of the real Al Capone. After hearing of the raid, Robert De Niro's version of Al Capone in the film reacts by bludgeoning the guy who was in charge of the warehouse with the baseball bat. This happened at a rather swanky dinner and much to the surprise of everyone there. Again, this was made up for the movie, but it is based on some bits of fact. Although we don't actually know the reaction Al Capone had after learning about the successful raids by the Untouchables team, we do know that on at least a few occasions, Al Capone did beat someone to death with a baseball bat. Now, those weren't necessarily tied to the liquor raids, but honestly, there's a lot that happens behind closed doors that we probably are just never going to know about. If you're starting to catch a theme with many of the scenes here, you're not alone. Another plot point that's largely fictional, but based loosely on something that actually happened, is the scene where Kevin Costner's version of Elliot Ness is visited by actor Del Close's character. 
In the movie, Del Close's character is billed as Alderman, but that's a fictional name. An alderman is an elected councilman. So when this character named Alderman comes to visit Elliot and offer him a bribe, and then Elliot turns him down, it's the filmmaker's way of showcasing how Elliot's team was untouchable. In fact, Del Close's version of Alderman even poses that question when he indignantly asks Elliot if he thinks his team is untouchable, hence the nickname. But that's not how Elliot's team's nickname, being the Untouchables, came to be. That whole scene is made up, but it seems to be an amalgamation of a few different realities coupled with a healthy dose of creative freedom. Just like all of the law enforcement officials in Chicago, Elliot Ness and his team were approached with bribes on numerous occasions. The movie even depicts some of the things that Elliot's crew actually did. For example... The part where Kevin Costner's Elliot Ness calls in the rest of his team to witness him throwing the bundle of bribe money back at Alderman was based on multiple reports from different members of the Untouchables where they physically threw bribe money back at people who were trying to pay them off. Probably the closest one that resembles what we saw on screen happened in April of 1930. We don't know the name of the person who approached Elliot Ness, but it was obvious he was on Al Capone's payroll, and he offered Elliot $2,000 up front and an additional $2,000 per week if he stopped digging into Capone's affairs. That $2,000 in 1930 is about the same as $29,255 today. That's the kind of money Al Capone offered Elliot Ness every single week to do what would really amount to be doing nothing to turn the other way. So it's easy to see how Al Capone was able to turn so many cops and other law enforcement officials with that kind of money. Anyway, this unnamed man's bribe was so offensive to Elliot Ness that he ordered the man out immediately. No sooner had the man left than Elliot called the press into his office to make a statement that neither he nor any of his men were for sale. Al Capone may have had many agents in his employ, but Elliot Ness would not be one of them. As for the name, Untouchables, that's a nickname given to Elliot's team by one of the reporters who took the story that day. The story they wrote explained that in no uncertain terms that while, quote, Scarface Al Capone might have been able to buy off others, Elliot Ness and his team were Untouchables, hence the name. There were a couple of indirect things that came out of this specific incident. One was that Elliot started to realize the power of the press. I mean, part of this is his ego, but I can't help but wonder if there's some sort of security blanket here. I mean, how are you going to stay safe when you are tracking a man who's paid off the cops and law enforcement that are supposed to keep you safe? One of the best ways is to make it painfully obvious if you disappear. And a great way to do that is to keep your name in the papers where everyone can see it. Now, since the names of those on Elliot's team were kept secret, only Elliot's name was publicized as the face of the effort, the catchy nickname Untouchables didn't take long to spread. Although, in all honesty, the term wasn't used as much as you might like to think. More on that later. After Alderman's attempted bribery of Kevin Costner's Elliot Ness in the film, the very next scene starts to put the whole untouchable thing to the test. It happens when we see Elliot walking in front of his home. Calling out from his car is one of Capone's mobsters by the name of Frank Needy. In the movie, Frank is played by Billy Drago. Frank Needy gets Elliot's attention and makes veiled yet very obvious threats against Elliot's life and the life of his family. In truth, Capone's men threatened to kill Elliot multiple times. Although it's probably worth pointing out that the family-focused man Elliot Ness that we see in the movie is riddled with inaccuracies. Those start with his wife, a character named Catherine Ness, played by Patricia Clarkson in the film. In 1930, the real Elliot Ness had been married to his first wife, Edna, for about a year. And yes, I said first wife. Elliot and Edna would remain married for nine years until getting divorced in 1938, he then married a woman named Evelyn from 1939 to 1945. His third and final wife was named Elizabeth, whom he married the year after divorcing Evelyn and would remain married to until he passed away in 1957. Now, some historians have also found evidence that 
perhaps Elliot was a womanizer, although most of that is circumstantial. It's not something we can actually prove. Still, it is one potential theory as to why the end of Elliot's first two marriages were followed up by marrying a new woman only a year later. So as a quick recap, there was no Catherine Ness. Elliot Ness had three wives, Edna, Eveline, and Elizabeth. That's a lot of E names. Oh, and in the movie, Elliot and Catherine have a daughter named, well, she doesn't have a name. Actress Caitlin Montgomery plays their daughter, and the character is billed simply as Ness's daughter. She probably didn't get a name in the movie because she didn't exist in real life. In fact, Elliot only had one son, and he was adopted during his third marriage with Elizabeth, or Betty, as she was called. That means during the timeline of the film, Elliot would have been married to Edna and without children. The next big scene in the film comes when the Untouchables head to Montana and they work with Canadian law enforcement to try and catch some of Al Capone's henchmen as they're crossing the border with alcohol. That whole scene, fiction. That includes catching one of Al Capone's bookkeepers and trying to scare him into cooperation. As is often the case when there's more and more inaccuracies in a film, Sometimes how that film resolves the storyline ends up being more inaccurate than at the beginning of the movie, and that's true in this case too. In the movie, two of the four men on Elliot's team are killed. The first is the accountant, Oscar Wallace. Then Sean Connery's character, Jimmy Malone, gets murdered in his home. As you can probably guess, since there was no real Oscar Wallace or Jimmy Malone, none of that happened. Even the real people that Oscar and Jimmy were modeled on were not killed. We know this because Oscar Wallace was primarily based on Frank Wilson, who wasn't even a part of Elliot's team. And as we learned earlier, Frank went on to have a successful career after Prohibition. A similar story is true for the character Jimmy Malone was based on Marty Lahart. Although Marty didn't have quite the illustrious career as Frank Wilson, he lived until 1975 when he passed away peacefully on July 2nd. 1975, at the age of 76. At the time of his passing, Marty was the very last of the original Untouchables team. Quite the opposite from being one of the first to die, as the movie shows. In the movie, as Sean Connery's version of Jimmy Malone is dying, he's telling Kevin Costner's Elliot Ness that Al Capone's bookkeeper will be at the train station. And now, At the train station, there's a scene where Elliot sees a woman trying to carry her baby's stroller up the stairs. And when he goes to help, he's seen by one of Capone's men, and this bloody shootout begins. All of this was made up for the film, but something worth pointing out, because it's based on something that's actually based on a different true story. So, The staircase shootout scene is director Brian De Palma's homage to a 1925 Soviet film called Battleship Potemkin. In that movie, there's a staircase scene with mass hysteria going on as the cinematography focuses on a baby in a carriage rolling down the stairs. That's a lot like what we saw in The Untouchables. If the name Battleship Potemkin rings a bell, it's because we learned about that in the Hunt for Red October episode. As a quick refresher, Battleship Potemkin was based on a true story of, well, a battleship named Potemkin in 1905, whose crew mutinied. That's the movie that Valerie Sablin showed to the crew of his ship as he led the mutiny. If you haven't heard that story, you can learn more about that in the Hunt for Red October episode. Anyway, it's a little bit ironic since the real person of Valerie was the basis for Sean Connery's character in The Hunt for Red October. Marco Ramius. But that's just a fun little side note. Back in the Untouchables movie, after Elliot gets Al Capone's bookkeeper to cooperate, Robert De Niro's Al Capone is pulled into the courtroom to stand trial. And this trial isn't for any of the murders, extortion, bootlegging, gambling, prostitution rings, or anything like that. It's just for tax evasion. Although pretty much everything we see in this movie is ultimately made up, the overall plot point of Al Capone being brought in to stand trial for tax evasion is actually true. This brings up an important point, though. Even though Elliot Ness and his untouchables were a massive pain for Al Capone's operation, just like the movie implies, no one could ever tie the gangster to any of his crimes. They knew his empire was massive. Some estimated that he was racking in about $60 million a year, which 
in today's terms, is just shy of $878 million. But as law enforcement agencies dug into the paper trails, as it turns out, nothing had Al Capone's name on it. Legally, he didn't own anything, and he didn't earn a salary. While Elliot Ness's team annoyed and put a dent in the gang's operations, it was Frank Wilson's team who reviewed literally millions and millions of documents until they came across just a few documents that had Al Capone's name on it. Legally, those documents proved that Al Capone made an income and he never reported that income to the IRS. In June of 1931, Al Capone was officially indicted for federal tax income evasion. Although the movie makes it seem like the trial was a rather quick one, in truth, it lasted for about four months. In fact, it wasn't until October 17, 1931, that Al Capone was found guilty. As the movie comes to an end, we see a newspaper that says Capone was sentenced to 11 years in prison. And that's true although the paper doesn't mention that he also was ordered to pay about $80,000, which again in today's terms would be $1.3 million, just in fines and legal fees. This is the end of the movie, but it is not the end of the story for Al Capone or Elliot Ness. It was, however, the end of Al Capone's career and his reign of terror as this infamous mob boss in Chicago, and he gets sent off to serve time in Georgia and then ultimately Alcatraz. While Capone is in prison, Prohibition is overturned. That happens on March 23, 1923, when President Franklin Roosevelt signs the Colin Harrison Act, which officially allows the manufacture and sale of alcohol. Well, actually, not all alcohol. Absinthe wouldn't be made legal in the U.S. until 2007. You can check out my podcast to hear a little bit more about that. But this is a start. Anyways... A few months later, on December 5th, the 21st Amendment is ratified, becoming the very first amendment in the Constitution to repeal an earlier amendment, that being the 18th Amendment that actually set up prohibition. Al Capone would serve eight of his 11 years in prison and was actually released early to a mental hospital in 1939, where he served his final three years. And after being released... Capone lived a fairly quiet life in Miami until he died of a heart attack on January 5th, 1947. As for Elliot Ness, after Prohibition was repealed in 1933, there wasn't a lot of use for an agent to enforce it. He was reassigned to a new unit with a very similar purpose, the Alcohol Tax Unit. With this new unit, he spent two years in the mountains of Ohio, Tennessee, and Kentucky looking for illegal bootleggers. It wasn't quite as exciting as Elliot's previous role, so in December of 1935, he resigned and moved to Cleveland, Ohio, where he took a position as the public safety director for Cleveland. In this new role, he worked directly for the mayor of Cleveland and rooted out corruption in the police, as well as any organized crime in Cleveland. Elliot thrived in this new role, at first. During his time as public safety director in Cleveland, Elliot was hot on the trail of yet another mastermind criminal. This wasn't a gangster hiding in the open like Al Capone. Instead, this one was a serial killer who earned the nickname the Cleveland Torso Killer on account of the dismemberment of anywhere from 12 to 20 victims. Elliot's brilliant investigative work on the case led to plenty of great theories. If you listen to the Black Dahlia episode, you'll know there's a theory that Elliot believed it was the Cleveland Torso Killer who relocated to California and killed Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia. And there's even a theory that suggests the Zodiac Killer might have ties to the Cleveland Torso Killer as well. Now, unlike with Al Capone, Elliot Ness was never able to see the Cleveland Torso Killer brought to justice. It's actually one of the serial killers who has never been found. As the years passed on and Elliot wasn't able to resolve this case, more and more people began to criticize him. And somewhat ironically, this led to him developing a rather nasty drinking habit and some somewhat OCD tendencies uh, regarding his work. That, coupled with long hours and perhaps some unconfirmed womanizing in there, might have been the reason for his failed marriages. 
Edna leaving him in 1938, and then Elevine in 1945. Under all of this public pressure, Elliot would ultimately resign his role as the public safety director. After this, Elliot ran a rather interesting gamut of roles as he tried to find his next big success. First, he rooted out prostitution as national director of the Social Protection Program. Then he left that and was appointed chairman of the board at Diebold, a company just south of Cleveland in Canton, Ohio. They make big bank vaults and things like that. He even set up an import-export company along with the famous leader of the Flying Tigers, General Claire Lee Chenault. In 1947, Elliot ran for mayor of Cleveland, but failed to attain that position. His final grasp at something solid was as a business executive in a Cleveland-based company called Northridge Industrial Corporation. By the time 1956 rolled around, Northridge was nearly bankrupt and forced to move to the tiny town of Cowdersport, Pennsylvania. It was a move that Elliot would make with the company. On May 16, 1957, Elliot Ness passed away in the same manner as Al Capone, a heart attack. Like the infamous gangster, Elliot's life was completely ruined at the time of his death. He was depressed and in an incredible amount of debt. Later that same year, Elliot's name would come back into the public's eye when an author named Oscar Frilly published an autobiography he co-wrote with Elliot Ness before he passed. The book was simply named The Untouchables, and its publication would cement the name of Elliot's team in the minds of people around the world. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan Lefebvre, along with Cody Wheat from the Shots of History podcast. If you want to dig further into the history of the real untouchables, I'd recommend picking up that book that we just talked about, Elliot Ness's autobiography, also called The Untouchables. Now, if you're listening to this, I'm assuming that you enjoy podcasts. So if you're looking for a podcast to learn more about the history of prohibition and all things alcohol, go check out Cody's podcast over at shotsofhistory.com. Each episode offers a quick but very informative glance at something to do with the history of alcoholic beverages. Finally, it's time to answer our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. Now, as a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Statement number one, the real Al Capone never sold illegal alcohol during Prohibition. Number two, aside from Kevin Costner's character, all of the untouchables in the movie are fictional characters. And number three, ultimately, the real untouchables weren't the ones primarily responsible for putting away Capone. Did you find out which one is a lie? The lie is number one. Although Al Capone had nothing to do with bringing about prohibition, after it was instituted, he didn't hesitate to add smuggling and selling illegal alcoholic beverages to his existing world of organized crime. Thanks again to Cody for his help putting together this special edition of the show. His podcast, once again, is Shots of History, and you can find him on Instagram and Twitter at Cody L. Wheat. That's C-O-D-Y-L-W-H-E-A-T. As for me, you can find me hanging out in the Based on a True Story podcast Facebook group, or you can tweet at me where I'm at Dan Lefeb, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B, or maybe you're not a fan of social media. You can shoot me a good old-fashioned email at dan at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Thanks again for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon. <laughs>